I would like to give you my views on the current picture for gold. Uh, and it's been a topsy-turvy picture. It is not as simple as perhaps we would have expected or wanted in the first couple of days of the year. And our initial chart kind of shows this. As you can see, this is a one-year chart for gold. Um, we have uh, that March volatility, as you can see, where the, the price plummeted along with just about everything. Uh, in early March, and then we had the rapid snapback. Now that was very similar to what we saw in 2008, but in 2008, it took months for that uh, process to develop and work its way through. Back then, because the markets kind of had that experience of 2008 behind it, um, knew what how these markets react in these kinds of liquidity crunches, um, and because it was such a sharp initial shock, we had a very rapid uh, ramp back up. In fact, uh, what took post-2008 a matter of weeks and months happened in a matter of just a few days back then. Uh, we had a very rapid rise. And what people kind of fail to, to realize is that we had two $300 rallies in the gold price uh, last year. We had that initial one. Then we had a, a period of consolidation through the summer, then another run up through August. Then a uh, kind of slow and steady decline as the election came up and, um, and we were kind of digesting news on the pandemic front, front and it started to get a little bit better. And then we had that bottom on November 24. Um, I think it's important to mention that there is an established pattern that ha has happened every year since December of 2015. Uh, in December of 2015, the Fed meeting in mid-December marked a launching point and actually marked the bottom for that long gold bear market. From that point, gold rallied very strongly into 2016. And then successively in every year since, we have had a late year rally, usually in December, sometimes as early as late October, uh, where we've reached a bottom and then accelerated and begun a rally that extended into the new year. This year, that bottom happened on November 24th, a little earlier than, than typical, but not the earliest by any means. And then we saw a, uh, a nice rally, and we saw, in fact, a very strong rally right outside, right out the gates in 2021. As you can see, that, that second red line marks the January early, the first two sessions, really, of uh, 2021, where we had a tremendous rally However, it's been not quite so much fun since. And what I'd like to do is kind of go into some of the specific reasons why that has happened um, and why we had that sell off. But first, let's go look at the big picture a little bit and see what's happened as a result of the pandemic and even before the pandemic. This chart of total Fed assets shows that the uh, the Fed really started the printing press and presses, as it were, rolling again in, uh, in early September of 2019. So really months before we had anything resembling a pandemic uh, or any knowledge of the pandemic, the Fed was already well on its way from in a new round of quantitative easing. It didn't call it quantitative easing for technical reasons, but the market accepted it as thus. And gold actually began to respond to that. But then that very steep, uh, precipitous rise there, parabolic rise in, uh, in the Fed assets, where it more than doubled its assets in the matter of just a few weeks, that was a, the immediate reaction to the pandemic. And gold obviously responded very strongly to that. What we've seen since is a bit more of a mixed bag, uh, a, a slower rise, a more jagged line, trend line. And in fact, last week, <clears throat> we actually saw the Fed assets uh, decline a little bit. But these declines are largely a technical situation with swap lines being paid back, et cetera. The Fed is still buying right now at a rate that exceeds anything it did in uh, QE1, 2, or 3 post-2008. So we are still in the kind of environment that's extremely supportive or should be extremely supportive of metals prices. Let's compare these uh, <clears throat> quantitative easing programs. Um, this is an interesting chart. It's 
a bit out of date, as you'll see from my additions here. But if you start down at the bottom of QE1, you can see that it went on for about a year and a half. And it <clears throat> it, it created or it, it, uh, it represented the massive amount of about $500 billion in asset purchases by the Fed. This was shock and awe back then post-2008. And it didn't seem to do the job because the Fed followed up that program of QE2, and that's our green line. That, again, was about $500 billion in purchases, but in about half the time. So it really accelerated those purchases. Uh, once again, that didn't quite do the job in uh, the Fed's eyes. So it instituted QE3, which was, as you remember, unlimited quantitative easing for as long as and for whatever degree was necessary to achieve the Fed's goals. And that went on for a couple of years and actually added the tremendous amount of about one and a half trillion dollars in, in purchases. So this is where we got that big increase in Fed assets over four trillion dollars. Then the Fed tried to taper it back. Let's look at that blue, that red line now. The entire quantitative easing uh, operations before the cumulative total of those operations had gotten the Fed balance sheet to about three and a half trillion after the, the tapering. The red line is the post-COVID response. That's $2.9 trillion in a matter of just a few weeks. Truly shock and awe, broke all of the records that the Fed had set before by a clear and, and, and large margin. However, that took us up just to barely the end of 2020. At the very tail end of the year, we saw that Trump signed a year-end $900 billion stimulus bill. So we have to add that $900 billion to that 2.9. Then, as of last night, uh, President-elect Biden announced $1.9 trillion in a stimulus plan. So you have to add to that 2.9 about 2.8. So essentially, that massive, unprecedented, uh, overwhelming amount of quantitative easing and stimulus that we saw post-COVID has essentially been doubled in just a few weeks in the new year. Assuming, of course, that they pass all that 1.9 trillion and that remains to be seen. Next chart, we'll see what that response has been and, and we've seen the M2 money stock absolutely soar, again, uh, just parabolic precipitous increase in M2 money stock. And this chart goes way back to the 1980s. And you can see this rate of change. This chart represents change from a year ago in billions of dollars, and it's absolutely exploded to the upside. You would think, of course, that this would mean uh, tremendous uh, inflation uh, because of this amount of new money, new currency being created. But we don't have that monetary adrenaline quite yet. The reason is because M2 money stock velocity has been falling. In fact, it's actually been falling since 2000 when we first saw the, the Fed start to really try to rescue the economy with open market transactions, with buying uh, securities, with essentially printing money. The reason for this is that M2 is calculated as the stock of money, I'm sorry, velocity of M2 is calculated as the stock of money divided by GDP. So when GDP is not rising, then it velocity falls. So what we've seen is that the government and the central bank have been pumping ever greater degrees, ever greater amounts of money into the economy with ever lessening effect. And that's why we had such a muted uh, post-2008 recovery. And in fact, we had monetary uh, velocity crater post-COVID, uh, as you can see in this last line, because GDP absolutely collapsed alongside of it. And, um, and yet we do see, and this is a sign that things may be changing, and what may be a bit different this time, a little uptick at the very end of this line, that shows that velocity has risen because the economy having been, been driven so low through artificial exogenous events is now showing just a bit more life, a bit more recovery and a greater recovery on a percentage basis, over 30% in the first quarter. 
uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the last quarter. And, uh, and, and so coming from a, a dramatic low to which it's been forced, the percentage increase in the economy is much greater. So we're seeing that uptick. And as we get a vaccine out there and we get a significant portion of the U.S. and the global uh, populace vaccinated, we're going to see uh, perhaps not getting back to the levels pre-COVID, but a dramatic rise in economic um, uh, activity. And then we'll see that, that velocity increase and we'll see, I believe, the results of inflationary repercussions of this tremendous um, degree of monetary liquidity. These are some charts that Bridgewater and Associates recently, uh, late last year, came out with as they went bullish on gold and in showing uh, the truly dramatic degree of, of accommodative monetary policies, currency printing, uh, interest rate uh, declines that have been uh, really since 2008, but accelerating uh, these policies since post-COVID. What we see here is the percentage of, percent of global debt in local currencies yielding below 1%. Now, roughly speaking, any currency or any yield below 1% is negative when accounting for inflation, so negative on a real basis. So here we, we can see that while sovereign debt is long been recognized as very high in the, the degree and the amount of sovereign debt that's yielding negative rates right now, or negative yields right now, uh, all of global debt, all of debt in the world is 80% of that is essentially at negative real rates right now if, with a negative yield adjusted for inflation. Now, central bank balance sheets, of course, all the other central banks have been exploding the balance sheets. Here we see that soaring per ounce of gold. This shows, in effect, that gold is very undervalued because so much more currency has been created and the price is yet to respond. And this chart, I think, shows a clearly shows that we have a long revaluation on the way. This is the value of the world gold stock divided by the money printed by central banks. Now, you can see if we just return to the mean, it's about 0.5 right now. If we just return to the mean of about 2.0, that would imply a, the price of gold rising fourfold. If we got back to the, uh, the values in 1980, that would imply that the price of gold would imply would, would rise by eight or more times. And if we go back and look at the long-term bottoms in the gold price in uh, the early 70s, actually the late 70s to 1980 and 2000 to 2011, we see that gold has a pattern, pattern of rising seven to eight times in value over these long-term bull markets. And that's precisely the kind of a bull market I think we've begun. Now, why did gold sell off after those first couple of days of uh, the year where it really soared in value? <clears throat> Simply put, yields spiked much higher as the market, as the bond market began to uh, anticipate and realize the degree of, of uh, monetary easing and the tsunami of fiscal spending that was oncoming now that Washington was consolidated under, under democratic control. This red line you can see is the spike in the 10 year yield. And as you can see, the blue line <clears throat> is the 10 year break even inflation rate, essentially the market's expectations of inflation. It did not have time to catch up to the spike in 10 year yields and, and thus the real rate of uh, yields, real yields actually uh, rose from its negative level. So the, 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 the real yields became less negative and gold plummeted as a result. Here you see that in this chart, as you look at that tail end on real yields in red, uh, when they, that line rose, in other words, uh, yield, real yields became less negative and gold price, the gold price plummeted as a result. You can also see through this chart that real yields in gold are very closely correlated. In fact, it is likely, uh, I think, easily the most uh, highly correlated factor for gold prices and something anyone needs to, to watch very closely. Um, I, I wanted to show this chart because it shows how closely the bond market is watching 
these rising inflationary pressures. That red line is the 10 year yield. The, the blue line is commodity prices in the uh, producer price index. And as you can see, when uh, commodity prices started to rise, the bond market quickly began to react in unison and yields have been rising as commodity prices have been rising. So let's look then uh, a little bit closer at the various markets and the metals and see where they are right now. I get these charts from my friend Ron Grease at thechartstore.com. I like to track this 14 week stochastic. It shows the swings in the momentum for the markets. As you can see, despite the sell off that we saw uh, early on or, or, or last week and actually continuing a bit today, the stochastic for gold is still on the upswing. This would really indicate that we have a couple of months at least in this, uh, this rally or in our positive momentum for gold. Uh, that said, I'm not quite as optimistic as this chart may indicate, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Silver, the same thing. The, the stochastic is rising. It would seem to indicate we have about a month or so of at least rising momentum. Now, copper has been a real star in the sector. Uh, it, it turned upward in uh, midsummer. And if you're a gold newsletter reader, you know that uh, we pointed out we, the new bull market in copper in July. And more than that, we also pointed out a new bull run in commodities in general, which seems to run, this chart runs very closely in parallel in, uh, with the copper chart. Both of those kind of bottomed in July and the upward momentum has been uh, sustained and, and very powerful. So I think we have begun post COVID or we're kind of anticipating the end of this pandemic. And we see that commodity prices across the board are responding. Uh, what we haven't seen is gold and silver really respond yet. And this, my final chart shows kind of where we are. We, we're we're drilling in and focusing in a little bit more. This is a two month chart. You can see that we hit the bottom in November, uh, late November for gold. And we had a nice rally going through the end of the year. That second red line uh, marking the end of the year. And then we had another couple of days. It really looked like gold was off to the races there. But then we quickly broke down and even our recovery or attempt to recover over the last few days has been broken. And today we see gold selling off another $20. And this chart is actually updated through this morning. And we see a further sell off in gold right now. So we have conflicting indicators <clears throat> here. We have the stochastics, the longer term stochastics showing a, a what appears to be a solid uptrend for gold and silver, very solid for copper and commodities in general but we see really disappointing price action in recent days as gold has in fact broken through both its 50 day and its 200 day today, broken through its 200 day moving average. Um, the good news is that the, uh, the RSI is approaching very oversold levels. So we could be approaching a near term bottom. Uh, in my many years of experience in the market, I have to note that when gold does not respond to positive news and kind of looks for reasons to sell off, uh, it's, it, it tends to foretell a more extended uh, uh, period of, or, of, of a downtrend in the metal. So the recent action has not been encouraging, but I do believe that longer term, we're going to have, and, and longer term meaning throughout this year, we're going to have rising metals prices. Uh, and that in fact, this current situation, because the fundamentals are so supportive, of gold and silver that this current situation right now really does represent a buying opportunity a second chance if you will to uh to invest in some of the better companies out there so with that uh this these this is my uh contact information goldnewsletter.com slash forward slash mif is an opportunity for you to subscribe for half price because you're at this forum uh, goldnewsletter.com, my New Orleans investment conference in October, and you can follow me on Twitter.